then they must declare you are Guido, and then you were entitled to have a lawyer there. And in many ways, you could argue that all parents of a missing child, certainly those who would be the last mm. to have seen them, could have to answer questions like that. So the being labelled our guido was not necessarily such a bad thing. However, I will acknowledge that there were leaks by elements of the investigation team which clearly were trying to portray that there was strong evidence that Madeline was dead and that we were involved. Well, there may be there two points here. The first point is the obvious one that needs to be stated. That there isn't an equivalent concept of our Guido in English law. Um, yeah, and I think the, the aspect on that is we've never been arrested, we've never been charged with anything, we've never stood trial. And, and do you happen to know whether under Portuguese law they have a category of suspect? I, I think it is loosely used, but um, you could have multiple Arguido within any investigation. And at that time, the title Arguido stayed with uh, those involved until the file was closed. Do you, do you think that rightly or, or wrongly the British press somehow interpreted Arguido as equivalent to suspect, which carried with it therefore yeah. its own connotation. I mean, clearly the, the word was used that way uh, almost exclusively. Now, at this point, we are in the late summer, obviously, early autumn of 2007. If I can move you forward to paragraph 39 of your statement. You're making the point that the, the, the story in terms of objective fact is beginning to run dry and reporters now are thrashing around for, for something new. Um, I think it's, it's probably worth just clarifying that within 10 days of being made our Guido, the prosecutor made an announcement that uh, all lines of inquiry, including uh, the abduction of Madeline were open and no charges were being brought at that time. Um, but that didn't stop the continued reporting of inaccurate, untruthful and incredibly damaging reports. From the perspective of the, the newspaper and the sort of economic calculation they may wish to conduct, um, you deal with this in paragraph 39, but circulation figures, is that correct? I think that's uh, clear, and uh, uh, Peter Hill has testified that to the Parliamentary Select Committee. Yes. The, the specific tone of um, the article's changes in September 2000, Seven. We're going to look at that particularly in a moment. You, you in paragraph 40, however, refer to one piece in the, the Evening Standard, which is, I think, the very day you were declared our Guido, the 7th of September 2007. Police believe mother killed Maddie. Mm -hmm. and was that the... There's been so many headlines of uh, similar gravity that I can't tell you honestly whether that was the first time. I think so that may have been the first time. And it was in the headline in August 2007, we were told by a BBC journalist, in fact he stopped us and said, have you seen what's getting reported? They're saying there's blood in the apartment, they're saying that you were involved in, you know, mm. Madeline's been killed and you were involved. So actually it was stirring up in August. And then you refer to two articles in the Daily Mail, which, uh, unless I've missed something, we don't have um, available today. But the, the, the first one published in September 2007, you, you summarise in paragraph 41, the subheading, I pray the Portuguese police are careering down. track but from the start a terrible nagging doubt has refused to to leave me um, that um, for what it's worth was corrected by 
I should probably clarify that uh, paragraph 41 refers to Kate rather than myself. Yes, but, uh, yes that's correct. And in paragraph 46, you deal with um, a theme which you're not the first to address, namely presence of photographers. And we, we know, of course, that you, you came home at a certain point. I can't remember precisely when it was. Um, but once you're home, you then have photographers outside your home. Can you just tell us, please, a little bit about that, uh, and in particular the impact that that had on you? Well, I think the first thing probably to say is it started uh, when we said we were leaving Portugal, which we'd already told the police was cutting in front, cameras, people hanging out windows, motorbike riders. Uh, it was just dangerous, frankly dangerous. Um, when we got back to our home in Rothley, again there were tens of journalists. Uh, we live in a cul-de-sac. Uh, at the end of it, camped outside the house, cameras, a helicopter crews following us, and we were hemmed in the house for a couple of days before the police moved them to the end of our uh, drive. Then you, you, you tell us that photographers were still Every day we'd be in the car, myself and two children, and the photographers would either spring out from behind a hedge to give, a, I guess, a start and look that they could attach. I don't know, fragile, furious, whatever they wanted to put with a headline. Um, but there were several occasions where they would bang on the windows, sometimes with the camera lenses. And, you know, Amory said to me several times, Mummy, I'm scared. You know. I'd like to point out the yeah. twins at that time were still only two and a half years old. They were very frightened. You deal with two further matters, but perhaps less serious than, than this, but um, because what you told us, of course, is the plain breach of the, of the code, which um, we may come to in due course. There's a photograph of you, Dr. John McCann, on a golf course, which obviously is a private place, and then the distortion of photographs of you, Dr. Kate McCann, to present, no doubt, a certain image. Uh, often coupled with the adjectives frail or fragile, which you have told us about. In terms of the effect on you, you described it, and of course it will be obvious to us, but looking more broadly, the effect on the continuing investigation, which after all is your primary focus then and as it is now, are you able to quantify that for us and describe it? Well, I think from reputational aspects aside, uh, the distress that was caused to us was the clear message that was going out uh, nationally, throughout Europe and internationally, was that there was very strong evidence that our daughter was dead and that we were somehow implicated in her disappearance. And we knew that if people believed that, then there couldn't be a meaningful search. Um, and it was incredible. And any aspects of campaigning for our search uh, with what happened to us and how it was portrayed in the media meant we were completely hamstrung in our ability to counter anything. Um, these, and were, these were desperate times, you know, we were having to try and find our daughter ourselves and we needed all the help we could get and we were faced with, and I know we'll come on to headlines, but corpse in the car. I don't know how many times I read body fluids in the car and it gets repeated that often. That becomes fact. There were no body fluids, you know. And we desperately wanted to shout out, it's not true, it's not true, but when it's your voice against the powerful media, you know, it, it just, just doesn't hell wait. And, you know, we're desperately shouting out internally, please stop what you're doing. I mean, we're trying to find our daughter and you were stopping our chances of finding her. And, and the point being, which I alluded to earlier, is that 
we were told in no uncertain terms that if we disclosed anything publicly which we knew to be in the judicial file, i.e. the results which had been shown to us, which we knew were not what was being reported about DNA, then we were threatened with a two-year imprisonment for breaking judicial secrecy. So we were being tried by the media and unable to defend ourselves adequately. You, you tell us in your statement a series of steps which were taken to try and abate this flood. Um, can I try and summarise it in this way? First of all, a meeting is organised with the editors of the major, major UK tabloid newspapers. That's in September 2007, um, when a, a clear message was put out to them. Can you tell us, well, that had a, a sure. transient effect? It's paragraph 53 of your... Sure. I think there, there's two elements. Within the first week of game, uh, being back, we had appointed uh, solicitors, Kingsley Napley and Angus McBride, who is one of the solicitors who represented us at that time. I uh, thought it was very important that he would, uh, we should try and modify the content of the press articles and uh, he went with uh, Justine McGuinness who was a campaign manager at that point and met with all the editors from the major newspapers and emphasised to them that it was his strong belief that there was no evidence to support what um, they were reporting um, but it seemed to have very little effect and uh, subsequent and in fact I think Kingsley Napley then pressurised Leicestershire Police to write to the broadcasters and editors and there's a letter from uh, Matt Baggett who was Chief Constable at that time urging restraint and saying there was m very inaccurate reporting. We organised another round of uh, meetings between with Angus and Clarence who then came back to work for us uh, later on in September 2007 and that was followed up with another letter from the Chief Constable I think on the 17th of October if my memory 8th of October Thank you Failed 17th of September, 8th of October yeah. <laughs> And obviously the, these things were done because the coverage was continuing in such a bad way you identify the worst offenders, and we'll be looking at this um, quite, quite carefully in a moment, uh, amongst the Express Group newspapers, mm -hmm. which included um, the, the Daily Star and the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, and the, the Sunday Star. Yeah. Now, did there come a point when warnings were given by your lawyers in the context of possible claims in defamation, by which I mean libel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kingsley Napley had written to the Express Group twice, explicitly, uh, telling them that they were on notice, uh, that we felt that the content of the articles was libelous, and we reserved the right to take action. Um, and then I think what you see in paragraph 66 is a series of articles produced uh, in January 2008 over a very short period of time, rehashing largely but with other things come on and I think it's important to emphasise we had met with uh, Adam Tudor from Carter Ruck, who's, as you know a libel specialist and we had talked about legal action which for us was always a last resort. Uh, we, had, we felt we had a more important battle to fight, which was finding our daughter. But we felt that, that it was our only uh, course of action open to us at that point that would stop it. And I think it's important to emphasise again um, some of the headlines that we faced. And they, they were incessant and they're not just slight inaccuracies. I mean, it was her blood and parents' hire car. Totally untrue. Um, well, let's, let's look at some of these articles, please. Um, what I'm going to do is in, invite your attention first of all to GM2, which is the schedule you have prepared directly underneath it of articles in the Daily Express specifically. And these run from the 27th of September 2007 to the 22nd of January 2008. <coughs> Now, the ones you have specifically identified in paragraph 66 of your witness statement 
we can look at, but first of all, we can get the flavour of some of the headlines. 9th October 2007, DNA puts parents in frame, British experts insist their tests are valid. 17th October 2007, parents' hit, parents' car hit a corpse, it was under carpet and boots, say police. And priest, I was deceived. There are about, um, I haven't counted them up, there are probably about 25 similar pieces running over a three or four month period. Let's just look at some of them, um, if you don't mind. Sure. We're in GM2, and the first of them... We're not intending to put these on the website, are we, Mr. J? Well, if, there, if there's a problem, we, we won't. I didn't understand there to be, but at um, the moment, these are not on any website, no. No, I just don't particularly want to give greater prominence no, no. or currency to articles that have caused enough distress in their time. Yes. By all means, refer to them, and that could be part of the evidence, but... Uh, it seems to me that's sufficient. Do you, are you content with that approach? And obviously the articles themselves have been pulled, but they are, the contents have been widely disseminated through many blogs, as you're probably well aware, but uh, we have no issue with discussing the content. Yes. Uh, but I, I think the best thing to do, unless, unless someone says I should adopt a different course, is I'm, I'm not going to ask for the articles to be put on the, the screen. Um, but I'm just going to, to refer to the articles and we can bring out maybe one mm -hmm. or two points. If, if at any point you tell me, no, you don't want me to sure. proceed down a particular road, of, of, of course I won't. Um, so I'll do this as, as quickly and as lightly as I can, Dr McCann, um, just to give the flavour. If, if you look, please, uh, at the internal numbering, which... Um, it's page 10 of GM2. Yeah. It was an article. <clears throat> it was her blood in parents' hire car, new DNA test report. And the overall flavour or thrust of this article was that there was DNA evidence which linked um, your daughter with a hire car. Um, what do you say about that? I'm sure you've got a lot to say about it, but, but in, in a nutshell, well, what the, is the, the position? The first thing to say is simply untrue. Yes. Madeline's DNA was not recovered from the hire car. That's the first thing. And yes. uh, the inference from this is, and I think the public who think that DNA is a very uh, strong evidence in cases would take this to mean absolutely that Madeline was in our hire car that we hired more than three weeks after she disappeared. Um, it's incredible. It's, um, interestingly enough, what they're doing is reporting a, a newspaper is saying that. So that's how it comes. That's how it comes out of a Portuguese newspaper. Well, often you'll find that there would be something down in the article. They weren't published in the prominence that they were in these papers. Yep. And no way of checking the source, which is a recurring theme. These are all sources and unnamed sources in the original articles. Can we move, please, to page 15? The headline reads Madeleine McCann's a main suspect, say police. Was that correct? Well, the police weren't speaking to the media under judicial law, and uh, we haven't had any of the police identified who have given the statements. I would like to know who they are. Perhaps they could face contempt of court proceedings. Thank you. <clears throat> now, page 17. And this is another headline you refer to in paragraph 66. Priest, open inverted commas, bans, closing inverted commas, Madeline. He takes down posters as prior to lose. And then... I think this should be open inverted commas, wipes her from its memory. And what, what's the innuendo there? It's pretty obvious, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is, and I think the, the 
key thing here is obviously that the church community in Pride de Luge were incredibly supportive to Kate and I uh, spiritually. Um, and uh, at that point they continued to help hold a, a weekly vigil for Madeline. Um, so obviously saying that we, you know, the, the town and the Portuguese locals have turned their back on us was a clear innuendo from this article, which again was not true. In, in, in GM3, if we can quickly navigate our way through that, this is another schedule of articles. Um, this time, however, we're looking at the Daily Star and the Daily Star Sunday. It's a similar number of articles, really. No, it's more. Maybe about 50 of them. But what is similar, the, the broad dates, from the 27th of September 2007 to the 22nd of January 2008. Two of the articles you, you specifically refer to in your evidence, we can just quickly alight on them. You can look at page 117, please, Dr McCann. An article in the Daily Star on the 26th of November 2007. Maddie, open inverted commas, sold, closing inverted commas, by hard up McCann's. Now, this is the article you, you do refer to, the, the selling into white slavery allegation. Probably, this, probably you don't want to dignify that with a comment. That's nothing short of disgusting. Mm. And I think this same journalist, if memory serves right, also said we stored her body in a freezer. I mean, they just... Yes. <sighs> and the final one... I mean, I've read all of these. Um, <coughs> Dr McCann last night, it's... Um, you could look at, at all of them. These, these are representative. But just, just to make the comment, there's absolutely no source for that assertion in that article. There's a generic reference to a bomb f bombshell new police theory, but completely not attributed. Yeah. Sorry. Probably entirely made up. Pa page 132. In capitals, she did die in hole, short for holiday, probably flat, semicolon. Blood traces in capitals are... And that is, car fluids in, in capitals are from corpse, and then dash, cops, colon, body had been moved. And then there's a reference to a possible grilling by the <coughs> British police over sensational new evidence. Again, are you going to dignify this with a comment or not? I mean, you can, uh, I hope, understand why uh, we felt we had to take proceedings from the severity and consistency of the allegations being made. Can, can, we, can we deal now with the proceedings? And if, if, if you want me to go further through the schedule, through the articles, please, please let me know. I detect you probably don't. We've, we've got enough of a, of a flavour. Is, mm. is, is that right, Dr McCann? But, but, but what happened next? Your, your, your solicitors have become... a involved, letters before action had been <coughs> sent. To pick up the story at paragraph 68, you say that on the 7th of February, your solicitors were contacted by the press and they, by the express, pardon me, and they proposed some sort of deal with you. Can you tell us about, about their proposal? It was pretty much said that because we were our guido, they couldn't uh, agree to a complaint, uh, but they did suggest that we did an interview with OK Magazine, which we found rather breathtaking. Right. And it goes without saying that that um, kind offer was not accepted, uh, and matters proceeded. Um, paragraph 69... 
Express by now had taken expert advice and they now indicated that um, their articles were defamatory. Is that right? Yes. Could, could you give us a sense of the, the, the time scale here? Can, um, the, the, the first offer from, Car from, from the Express was the 7th of February. This was the Hello Magazine offer. But when, when did the admission of wrongdoing, as it were, come? So it did drag out a bit. I uh, can't give you the exact dates. Um, Catarock um, do have it on file, but um, there was an acknowledgement um, that they might be prepared to uh, make an apology and um, also consider damages. Um, we wanted to make sure that those damages reflected the seriousness of what they had um, published and it was, to be honest, the damages for us were a secondary consideration. Um, it was more about getting a front page apology uh, yes, to send a clear message that we wouldn't tolerate um, these ongoing allegations in other newspapers. Papers either. The statement in open court was read out on the night. Well, just to read that, in addition to the allegations referred to above, the Daily Star published further articles under the headlines, which sought to allege that Mr. and Mrs. McCann had sold their daughter in order to ease their financial burdens. A further article alleged that Mr. and Mrs. McCann were involved in swinging or wife swapping. As the defendant now acknowledges, all of these allegations were and remain entirely untrue. In particular, there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that Mr. and Mrs. McCann were responsible for the death of their daughter, that they were involved in any sort of cover up, and there was no basis for express newspapers to allege otherwise. Equally, the allegation that Mr. and Mrs. McCann may have sold Madeline. They were involved in swinging or wife swapping were entirely baseless. Naturally, the repeated publication of these utterly false and defamatory allegations has caused untold distress to Mr. and Mrs. McCann. Indeed, it is difficult to conceive of a more serious allegation. Let's just, let's just provide some context. Thank you. What may be worthy of consideration, though, is the possible rapidity of change of stance. On the one hand, they were maintaining their articles, they get leading counsel's advice, and all of a sudden they say it's all entirely wrong. We, maybe it's worthy of consideration how uh, and why that, that vault fast occurs. Could you tell me this? They presumably published something as well. Where was it published? The apologies. Yes. They were on the front page. We insisted. And we would have gone to court to get that. Do we have that? I don't think we have the text of the apologies on the front page, do we? Okay. Not the full apology. Uh, All right. We can, have, we, can, we can look at those if, if necessary. Um, you, you deal with the issue of, of exemplary damages, punitive damages, mm -hmm. in paragraph 71. Yeah. Um, but you decided in the end not, not to pursue those, is that correct? It is. We were told that we had, after Cataract had taken counsel's advice, that uh, we would be very likely to be successful in such a claim. Uh, and my understanding of that was that uh, there would be a very strong argument that Express Group newspapers knew that the allegations, or many of them, were unfounded, or certainly couldn't prove any of them. And despite what we, the steps we had taken from September 2007 through to issuing proceedings made it very clear there was no evidence to back it up that we could only assume they were acting for profit. <coughs> After these matters, we're now in March of 2008. The answer to the question may be fairly obvious, but were there any further objectionable articles in the British press? There was certainly a dramatic sea change uh, within Express Group newspapers, and um, 
I think largely the coverage has been much more responsible and balanced. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been articles published which are untruthful. Um, they may not be libelous or defamatory, some of them, and we've had to have certain articles pulled, but there was a clear change. Um, and with hindsight, I wish we'd taken action earlier. In paragraph 76, you deal with related litigation involving your, your friends, I believe, who were with you on holiday. Can, can I take this point quite shortly? That sure. they, too, recovered damages. I yep. think, in total, the, the amount was £375,000. But, but so it's clear, I've been asked to, to draw this from you, that the defendant to the proceedings brought by your friends was, again, Express Newspapers or yep. their, their, their publishers. The, the Sun reported it, although the Sun themselves, to be absolutely clear, were not the defendants, they hadn't defamed you. They, they, they reported the, those settlements, I, I'm told, at page 25. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there were similar reports in, in the Daily Mirror. But, so there's no doubt about it, the Sun and the Daily Mirror are not the defamers. They are reporting what's happened in relation to um, proceedings brought by other organs of the press. Paragraph 78 to 80, Associated Newspapers, please. You made a further libel complaint in July of 2008 in relation to coverage in the Daily Mail and the Evening Standard. Can, can we be clear which to which articles these, these relate, since you don't specify it in paragraph 79. Uh, have I got this right? Are, are, are you referring back to the article at paragraph 40 of your witness statement, Dr. McCann? There were a large number of articles, um, similar uh, tone to the ones that we had complained of previously. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was more, again, about DNA, blood, suspects, Madeline being killed, etc., rather than anything uh, else. You, Paragraph 40. You identify one article in the Evening Standard published on the 7th of September 2007. Sure. There were many similar articles like that, particularly in the Evening Standard at that time. Um, the corpse in the car was the Evening Standard, I think. I'm not sure what was the outcome of, of these libel proceedings. Uh, we did uh, settle. Um, they paid damages and uh, there was an apology published in the Evening Standard. Uh, the Daily Mail did not publish an apology. One point you, you, you make. Um, these libel proceedings were brought with the benefit of conditional fee agreements, is that correct? Yeah, I think it's very important um, given the scale of the task uh, that faced us and we were given, we made our decisions after being fully informed of the pathway and I think that's very important. It was a last resort um, and at the time, given our circumstances, um, I do not believe we would have had the resource to uh, go down that path if it wasn't for a CFA being in place. This is going to be your choice. It won't happen for anybody else, but it will be your choice. If you'd like a break for five minutes, we'll have it. If you'd prefer to carry on, we'll carry on. I'm happy to carry on. Yeah. Right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I ought to say I've confirmed it with yes. the shorthand right. There's a fair bit more, and I don't want to rush this, but sure. we'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, <clears throat> you, 